In 1982, the Roland Corporation released a budget polyphonic synthesizer, the Juno 6. In order for it to be affordable, there had to be compromises, and with a stripped-back feature set based around a single oscillator per voice, Roland resorted to a couple of old tricks from the 70s, a sub-oscillator and a chorus circuit, to artificially beef up the sound. Now, whilst this synth would serve a purpose, on paper you'd expect it to have been forgotten about within a few years, but instead, the Juno 6, and to a greater extent its siblings, the Juno 60 and the Juno 106, are amongst Roland's most popular of the 1980s, and 40 years later, people are willing to pay a pretty price for an original unit, and some components have even been brought back into production to keep them going even longer, prompting Roland to bring out a modern successor, the Juno X. So I wanted to explore what happened here and pose the question, why do we still care about the Juno? So let's start with the original from 1982, the Juno 6. So rather than a drawback, the stripped down feature set is actually one of the synthesizer's assets because if you're new to synthesis, like a lot of people were when they first experienced the Juno, on the front panel are the controls for one of each of the basic building blocks of a subtractive synthesizer, oscillator, filter, amp, envelope, LFO. And with a slider or a button or switch for each of the functions, you can not only very quickly find out what each one of them does, but you can find out how they affect one another. So if you can think of a sound, you can find it very quickly. So you can see I went from a sawtooth wave with nothing where I needed it through to your kind of classic Juno funk sound in 20, 30 seconds. And most of the popular sounds take less than a minute to set up on the Juno. And that brings me to my next point, which is because it's so simple, that meant that Roland could dial the whole thing into a sweet spot where it's very hard to make a bad sound. So if you're again new to synthesis and you're not very confident with sound design, it's really gratifying and it's really rewarding. The next thing is, again, because it's so simple, it encourages you to experiment with all the different permutations of the settings on the synth. And so you not only learn your instrument inside out, but you learn a bunch of lessons that you can take with you to more complicated synthesizers. And it's quite surprising what you can get from so little. And the last thing with the original Junos are the electronics. So the filtering is done with Roland's IR3109 chips. Uh, the VCAs include Roland's BA662 OTAs. And the envelope generators are Roland's IR3R01s, which are all the exact same ICs that you find in the Jupiter 8. So they did not scrimp on the quality of the circuits. They just used less of them. And when you combine that with that multi-wave DCO and that very warm and wide stereo chorus, it's just a recipe for a fundamentally good sounding synthesizer.
The same year as the Juno 6 came the updated Juno 60, which only has very minor differences. The major things that it brought with it were patch memory and external connectivity with Roland's digital communications bus. And that brings us to this one, the most famous Juno of the lot, the Juno 106 from 1984. Now, as well as all the simplicity of the original Junos, this one brought with it MIDI, which then made it applicable for all sorts of styles of music that aren't based around playing the keyboard. So the other thing with the Juno 106 is because it has this very direct and uncluttered sound, it responds incredibly well to external effects, which then gives you a whole bunch of things to try out, none of which are more complicated to understand than the Juno itself. And talking of effects, the chorus circuit, which I said earlier was there to artificially inflate the sound, has actually become iconic in its own right, to the point that there are various emulations of it and Roland have even released a standalone version of it in software. And the other reason I think we still care about the Junos is nostalgia. Uh, there's something very alluring about looking back at a slightly mysterious pre-internet world through a very rose-tinted lens uh, and exploring a kind of fantasy version of it. It's just a form of escapism. And these original units, uh, the way they look, the way they feel, even the way they now smell, uh, is just really evocative of that. After the Juno 106, there came the Alpha Junos, and then more recently there's been things like the Juno G, the Juno DI, the Juno DS. Uh, and those are really a different design, a different sound, and in the case of the Alpha Junos, a different legacy and a different story, which is why they're not included in this video. So those, in my opinion, are the reasons why we still care about the Juno. And that brings us neatly to this, the brand new one, the Juno X which brings back the sound and the hands-on control of the original Junos, but also has its own engine based on the same paradigm. of little cool updates for the Juno X native engine are a Juno Super Saw Wave and a pitch envelope.
And of course, it contains that chorus, now with an additional third mode. And in fact, you can mix all three modes together. And you can blend in and out that infamous noise. And as demonstrated earlier, the Junos respond really well to effects, and the Juno X has a whole pile of effects built into the synth itself. And if you hit shift and enter to initialize, it's every bit as quick and hands-on to use as the originals. Thank you to Roland for sponsoring this video. Thank you to you for watching. And as we've got three Junos in the same place at the same time, I think the only thing left to do is...